Priestess, Maliolus has decided to withdraw from the election. Oh, well, that's surprising. But thank you for telling me. I'll let everyone know. Citizens, I have an announcement. Maliolus has withdrawn his candidacy from today's election. Unless any new challengers are nominated by nightfall, Sentius will be re-elected magistrate by default. That is all. Ave again. Did you find what you need? Interesting. I'm not sure why you're telling me, but you've come to the right person. Did you find a pattern then? What have you noticed? Yes, I suppose that could be something. But then most of us do tend to carry coins on our person, don't we? What else? <sighs> yes, I understand many of our friends were carried here by a river current. What else? That's true. I know I wasn't entirely sure how I wound up here. It's as I feared. I think I understand what poor Livia has been going through. Let me ask you this. Did you happen to encounter a stranger in the forest before you arrived here? And did you happen to catch her name? I see. And was this Karen by any chance wearing a hood? Because I've seen her before. There's something I think you should see. I think you'd better follow me to the baths. But don't follow too closely. We can't have people thinking we're bathing together. Don't you just love springtime? You're here. You were asking how I knew the young woman you met by the river was wearing a hood. Here. Look down at the bottom of the baths. It's a little hard to make out in this light. If only we could see. Oh, what a marvelous lamp. But do you see it? Somebody waking up by a river in a forest to find a hooded figure with a coin. It's just as you described it. Only your pronunciation is a little off. The name you heard wasn't Karen. It was C-H-A-R-O-N, as in Charon, the ferryman of the dead. Charon, who in exchange for the right coin, helps the souls of the newly deceased cross the Styx, the river that separates the land of the living from the land of the dead. When I dragged you out of the river, I thought you were never gonna wake up. I checked your pockets for ID, but all I found was some loose change. Feels like I've spent my whole life in a dead-end job with an endless commute. Sorry if I sounded cagey, it's just that... I don't always get the best reactions when I introduce myself. My name's... Karen. I'm so sorry, my friend. I'm so, so sorry. I take it you know what this means. I'm afraid so. It's all starting to make sense. All these people, whose last memory was running from the fires toward the river. It seems none of them escaped with their lives after all. Perhaps we should be grateful they don't remember their final moments. It also tells us 
that the Golden Rule is the work of Pluto, the god of the underworld, and why his epithet has always been father of riches. I know it's a lot to take in, and you look as if you have questions, so I'll try to answer them if I can. That was my first thought, too. In the old stories, the underworld was where the souls of the deceased were taken. But it was also possible for the living to reach it without dying, if they were particularly fearless. So I'm afraid I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting you're not from here. If you were Roman, or even Greek, you would know these stories. Each of them is slightly different, whether the storyteller was Plato, Homer, Virgil, or Ovid. But they always involved the souls of the dead, meeting a grim ferryman named Charon on the bank of a river. It was said that he'd help the new arrival cross, only if they could pay him with a coin, an obol. That's why it was once our custom to bury our loved ones with a coin in their mouths. Charon's obol, we called it. Of course, an obol was a kind of Greek coin, because we inherited this knowledge from the Greeks. To be fair, the ferryman isn't exactly as the poets described, and he, she, they, they seem to appear to different people in different guises. You say you saw a young woman named Karen with a hood, and I once heard Kabash mention a stranger in a ram headdress named Kurti. And Rufius described meeting a stranger named Kamut Tabal wearing an eagle headdress. But whatever form this stranger took, they were always wearing a hood of some sort, and their name always began with a K sound. I suspect the only way you'll solve this riddle is if your paths cross again. Good question. Let's see. In the stories, Charon would always require a coin as payment for passage across the river. But that never made any sense to me. What does an ancient immortal being need with coins? In our case, it seems Charon didn't take the coins we had. He or she merely checked we had one in our possession. So, maybe there's something special about the coins each of us had on us. That might explain why we wound up here, but so many others did not. No. I mean, I had my suspicions, especially after Livia's ramblings, but I would never have figured it out without your help, I promise you. Now that we know where we are, we have to figure out what to do about it, if we don't want to be cast into gold for eternity. We don't have much to go on except the old stories. I remember four in particular about heroes in the underworld. Hercules, the demigod and son of Jupiter, Orpheus, a Thracian poet, Sisyphus, a king of Ephyra, and Aeneas, a Trojan hero. Hercules was able to leave the underworld because he cowed its god with his strength. Sisyphus and Orpheus both relied on their wits instead. They persuaded the goddess of the underworld Proserpina to help them escape, and finally Aeneas was able to escape with the help of a spirit guide, who led him through a secret gate. So it seems you have two options, to confront the god of the underworld head on, or find a way to escape with the help of Proserpina or some other guide. It's a reasonable question, but the problem is, this place is fairly well designed to keep us here. There's no way to climb up the shaft. And even if you could build a ladder big enough, just trying it would break the golden rule. We know that, thanks to the writings left behind by those who've tried. All Romans try to avoid saying it, and the reason is quite simple. He might hear us. You may refer to him as Pluto if you wish, but you'll only be calling attention to yourself. Do so at your own peril. Shh! Is everyone so blunt where you're from? Oh. That option would be the boldest, but also the only way to learn the truth about the Golden Rule, and maybe even put an end to it. As I said, 
Hercules managed to overpower the god of the underworld, but he was a demigod. Forgive my candor, but you are no Hercules. Are you telling me that you can? I won't pretend to understand exactly what that means, but if that's true, then perhaps you stand a chance. So, if you want to confront him, I'll help you as much as I can. Who knows? Perhaps your name will be uttered in the same sentence as Hercules one day. But first, you'd need an audience with you-know-who, and for that, you'll need to enter the great temple overlooking the city. The problem is, the door has been sealed shut for as long as I've lived here, and there doesn't even seem to be a keyhole. I suspect the answer lies in the desecrated obelisk in front of it. I'm not sure if you noticed, but there are four plaques missing from its base. It looks as though somebody, or a series of somebodies, forcibly removed them, and in doing so, dishonored and angered our Divine Keeper. If you could recover and replace all four of those missing plaques, I imagine he might be willing to receive an audience again. It's the towering stone monument, with four sides and a pyramid-shaped head, that stands before the great temple, a dedication to the god of this place. You'll find them all over Rome, but of course they were looted from Egypt many years ago. It seems one of them made its way here too, although how is a mystery. However, this one is unusual in that each of the four sides is decorated in a different style, Roman, Greek, Egyptian, and another I don't recognize. That means you'll need to recover four different plaques, Roman, Greek, Egyptian, and a fourth, a mystery plaque. Good question. To answer that, we first need to ask who would have defaced the obelisk in the first place. It would have had the god's name engraved into it, so it may be that whoever desecrated it wanted that name to be forgotten. And there's only one group of people I know of who might want to do that. There's a cult in Rome that often argued there is only one true god. Theirs, of course. They've been known to start fires, as well as deface religious monuments whose existence challenged their beliefs. If I were you, I'd go looking for them. Of course, they've all been in hiding since the fire last year, so finding them won't be easy. But I did hear a rumor they have a secret shrine somewhere in the city. Perhaps, if you could find that, you might be able to recover the Roman plaque. I don't know. But perhaps you should begin your search with the local Greek fellow, Georgius. His store is in the forum. Perhaps Kabash, our Egyptian resident, would be able to tell us. Unfortunately, he disappeared weeks ago. But I did hear Aurelia is peddling rumors about him at the tavern, so perhaps you could talk to her, or just take a look in his room. I'm afraid you're on your own with that one, but perhaps finding the other three will illuminate the way. As I mentioned, both Orpheus and Sisyphus were said to have persuaded Proserpina to help them escape, and Aeneas was guided to the exit. The problem is, those are the stories of a poet, a self-aggrandizing king, and a brawler about their own heroic deeds, so they should be taken with a grain of salt. First, Proserpina. What we do know about her is, well, it's a grim tale. It's said the god of the underworld abducted and dragged her here against her will, forcing her into marriage. It is. The gods are a mirror image of mankind, as far as cruelty is concerned, I'm afraid. If the stories are true, I imagine she's as desperate to escape as we are. If she really did help Orpheus and Sisyphus, perhaps she'll help us, too. The problem is... How do we communicate with her without being noticed by her captor? Leaving that aside for a moment, there is also the possibility of a spirit guide. I don't suppose you've come across one of those in your travels? 
Truly? And you're only bringing this up now? Then again, I suppose you were worried I'd think you were as mad as Navia. Can you tell me more? Is it the same voice? What kinds of thing does it say? Fascinating. Perhaps she is a benevolent spirit. Or perhaps... Hmm. Perhaps you're hearing the voice of Proserpina herself. If she has indeed been abducted, it would make sense for her to speak in cryptic whispers to avoid detection. Tell me, has she told you anything that might lead you to the way out? That is strange. There are no rivers here. Hmm. Let me think on that. Well, as far as I can tell, water flows into the city from an aqueduct into one of two cisterns, the upper cistern. If that's the current she's talking about, then perhaps you need to get into the upper cistern somehow. I vaguely recall wondering what was in there, but the door at the back of the great temple is locked up tight. You might be able to get a key from the magistrate, but if that doesn't work, perhaps you can find another way in. Let me know if you find anything in there. All right. I would suggest not discussing this with anyone. The best we can do for them is to let them remain oblivious for as long as possible. As for Livia, it seems she's been shouldering the weight of this terrible secret all this time. Perhaps it would comfort her to know she's not alone. In any case, time is of the essence, so you'd best begin. May Fortuna guide you, although you may not need her with Proserpina on your side. Isn't the great temple majestic? Fellow traveler from a faraway land. You, partner. Do you have the bow? Wonderful. Just go ahead and slide it under the door for me and I'll unlock it for you. A little bit slow, aren't you? Yes, I locked you in. And until you give me my bow, you're going to stay in there, like Tantalus in Tartarus. <laughs> no, technically, I never said that. I said, if we were to split all those riches between the two of us, infinite wealth is still infinite. It's hardly my fault if you can't tell the difference between a hypothetical and a promise now, is it? Oh, I do love a good loophole. You're just going to have to take your chances, I'm afraid. The bow, now. And don't even think about giving me the fake one. I'll recognise my own handiwork. Hmm. I would reconsider my position quickly if I were you. I'm not sure if you noticed, 
But you're stuck in there with a hornet's nest, and they can be rather aggressive toward intruders. You know, some say it takes 27 hornet stings to kill a man, but I always wondered how anyone could have known that. Let's find out if they were right, shall we? My beloved Galatea, I write this so that one day, when we're finally together, you will understand what I've done and why I had to do it. The others will call me mad or a monster, but I don't care what they think. Everything I'm doing here, I'm doing for you. I'll start at the beginning. Soon after my arrival here, as I walked down a corridor lined with golden statues, I thought I heard a whisper behind me. A rasp of air, as if vocal cords of metal strained to say a word or two. I tried to dismiss the idea, tried to concentrate on my work as the city's medic, but that tortured whisper haunted me. Weeks later, in the hallway to the bathhouse, I heard it again and found myself drawn to the statue of a Roman woman wearing a stola. Her face was contorted with anguish and fear, and, disturbingly, it was as if she was looking right at me. As I walked past her, I heard that strained whisper again, and turning back, I discovered that, even though I had moved, she was still looking right into my soul. That was when it dawned on me. This was no statue. This was a woman 
trapped within that golden prison. Naturally, I told the others, but when I could not reproduce the results of my experiment, they would not believe me. But from that moment on, I knew the full horror of this place. Immobilized within these statues are living, human beings. It was that day, my love, that my heart broke. Ooh. Mm. 